uh, for our next presentation, we have the combination of Mike Kronk from Grass Valley and James Stelflug from EVS. They're here to talk about super slow-mo workflows. And this is a very exciting topic for me because 2110 has enabled this a lot more than uh, some of the other workflows we've had before. Uh, due to the tremendous data rates needed to support uh, multiple frames per second, uh, we're going to need a lot of bandwidth. So take it over. Absolutely. And uh, hi, everyone. My name is James uh, from EVS, and uh, Mike's joining me here. I'm Mike from Grass Valley. And I think we've done this stick before. So if we get a little punchy, let us know. We're, uh, we haven't actually rehearsed any of this, and that's your, your preface to the entire conversation. But I wanted to kind of set the stage for what we're talking about here and make sure everyone's up to speed. When I say super mo, what do we mean? Well, I'm going to quickly give a frame of mind. Grass Valley cameras are actually shooting our live presentation here right now, and an EVS server is in the rack recording those cameras. But that's a normal frame rate situation, right? It's normal HD recording this regular frame rate, so you don't have to belabor listening to me any slower than I might talk. But when we start enabling the things that we and our companies do in live sports, it's getting into this category of high frame rate, you know, the, where the camera starts acquiring at a much higher frame rate uh, than we're doing here in this situation. So these high bandwidth flows is the main use case that kind of triggered uh, what our presentation is covering here uh, in the discussion. So rather than taking a regular frame rate camera like the example in the live room here, we're talking about the use case where in an SDI domain, because the camera was operating at a higher frame rate, in SDI, we had to come up with a methodology many, many years ago how we deliver those high frame rate feeds from the camera towards a recording device in a production environment. And the way that was done in SDI was to just add more SDI cables and then slice apart that content in time so that each SDI, when you put them all back together on the recording side, makes up these high frame rate environments, and that's what makes up those really immersive, super slow-mo content you see during the sporting events that we kind of manage jointly in the market. So when we're talking about this, there's a couple of other use cases out here. We're talking about Ultra HD 4K, and in SDI, you could do it with a single wire by going up to a 12 gig interface. Or the other methodology in the past was to still, because you might have constrained infrastructure, is to take those cameras operating at a higher bit rate than what the wire can accommodate, is to divide that up by you know, slicing it and dicing it into more of a 2SI, where we take a different way to interleave that content, but nonetheless it was meant to solve the same problem where the wire couldn't suffice what I had to move down that path. So that's how we kind of did these things back in SDI. And I like to always kind of remind the topic that SDI was easy, right? We had a point-to-point -point wire. So if I start increasing the number of flows coming from a camera going to a recording device, an SDI, I would like to say it was perceived by a lot of our customers as easy. You simply add more wires from a device or a camera or a server through a patch panel to a router. Whatever it is, it seems easy to the users who were familiar with SDI. But in reality, this has been a nightmare in the real market because users have to troubleshoot it. What happens if I crisscrossed a wire somewhere? I didn't have anything to tell me what was on that wire. So I had, we all had to implement ways in our devices to make novelty ways to help the user identify when they've crisscrossed one of those multiple wires. Typically proprietary to each camera vendor, right? Exactly. There was no standardized way to do it. It was what, you know, each vendor came up with ways to say, I can make this easier, but there was no actual way on the SDI wire to really declare that and make it simpler. So as we're looking at this, you know, what you'd start to see in these situations, if I take the example I gave of the cameras going to a recording device, you have the source and you might have a destination and you have multiple wires. And if I look at the example of having up to eight wires, what that could mean is I could end up having two 4K cameras across those wires. But then because we started making really flexible devices in the ecosystem, someone could reconfigure that camera to operate in another mode and could say now it's going to operate as an eight times super slow-mo camera. So those same wires might be serving a different purpose, but the, to the user, they don't know what's on the wire. So now you have a cabling nightmare of trying to figure out what's going between the two devices in SDI. This person's spending hours in front of an interface to manually go back and remap their router, manually troubleshoot wires, unplug and figure out what happened and where's my problem. 
right? That's right. And one day you could be doing, in the U.S., say, a baseball game. The next day is a football game, and, and they may have different specifications. The camera can automatically switch. The server can automatically switch. But now I got to start reconfiguring wires, which is time. Time equals money. Yeah. And, and I usually tend to set the framework where SDI, by nature of itself in the infrastructure, was a dumb interface, right? There was nothing telling the user which way the content was flowing on the wire. There was nothing to tell them what content in terms of the slices of time or the, the different phase of the 2SI signal of an HD or a 4K signal. Nothing to really help you identify what is what other than little proprietary ways that different uh, vendors would try to help make that a little bit easier. So really SDI is manual, right? You build your little list, all your connection listing has to be statically listed, and IP can make this much, much easier when we start looking at all of these problems. So really, when you talk about this, it's the recabling on the back of the cameras, on the back of the servers, maybe at the I.O. panels outside of an OB truck. Um, and when you look at this, we all know that time is money, right? The time to troubleshoot, the time to figure out what's going on, while not oftentimes quantified during these live productions, it's an impact. So when we look at IP, I think we took the opportunity to say, we can do this much better. And the standards that are being defined here in this room and emerging from groups like Ames, groups like BSF, and these different uh, discussions going on, the standards have the right tool sets. And so from this, we can really go beyond these initial problems of SDI and, and make it better. Right, Mike? That's right. So. You want to take this slide or? You go, you do this one, I'll, I'll, I'll pick keep up doing this one. So when I talk about this, I also like to say we can make things simpler, but we can also make things smart. So now that you start to have cameras, servers, switchers, devices on the network, and with IP and the different uh, methodologies you're seeing here, we can now let these devices declare exactly who they are, what they are, and what the flows are that they're emitting under the fabric so that now all of those connections become smart. So now the thing can tell you exactly the fact that I'm a camera and I'm running in a super slow-mo mode. And now it can exactly expose what video standard is moving across the IP fabric. It can tell you exactly the resolution, the frame rate, whether or not there's HDR, different metadata, so that now we can make the fabric of the infrastructure smarter than SDI ever was. And that's kind of the core principle here is the right. fact that now we have the right tools being built uh, and we are going to apply this to the use case I just kind of set up in this first discussion. So when we look at these, we're talking about the switches and I think Amar in the previous session led into this quite well. You know, there's higher port speed coming. We're talking, he talked about 400 gig and, and other things in the data center, but not everyone has the ability to make a 400 gig fabric everywhere just because they might have 4K or super slow motion. In certain places, you're going to have a constrained switch. And, and there's cost considerations. I mean, he mentioned the, the curve, right? So I can go economically into a 1040 today, or I can spend more money on a, on a 2500, or one, you know, at the end of the year, a, a 400. But I can s save money, have an existing switch that I have, and how do I, how do, I do things like super slow-mo in that environment that can automatically scale? And at, at some point, even if I have a 100 gig switch, if one day we're doing 8K with you know, 10X super slow or something like that, you're going to run into barriers there. So can we have a method that's programmatically understandable that anything that, that comes at us, we can automatically conf configure? Yeah, exactly, because I think the philosophy we took when we saw this use case was that the initial catalyst was the fact that 10 gig switches and 10 gig interface points were the barrier. You couldn't move 4K across it because it didn't fit. You couldn't move SuperMO across it because it didn't fit. Even though bigger port speeds are coming, it doesn't mean the problem will inherently go away. They will come up again, as you just described, as further enhancements of video standards and higher frame rate cameras get deployed. That's right. So as we're going through this, I think the foundation became the fact that the, the open standards that have been endorsed by the groups here and being shown in the interoperability become the foundation the tools for what now we're, we're applying to solve the problem. So SMPTE 2110, the NMOS protocol, and PTP all become those tool sets in the arsenal. That's right. So Mike, you want to go a little bit further, just kind of breaking down what we're starting from and uh, you know, sure. what the foundation of the, the topic. So as James said, we're, we're building on the standards that are already there, and you'll see that, that what we're talking about, this, this method uh, for automatically being able to handle super slow-mo, whatever the, the port speeds is, is, is it's actually going into a SMPTE 
uh, RP, a recommended practice. That's, that's a, that runs through the whole ISO process. It's an engineering document, but it builds on these as a recommendation for when I have a super slow camera. This, this is how I can interface it into uh, switches. So the base standards are SMPTE ST 2110. Uh, these are all uh, published, uh, most of them for a little bit less than a, than a year. So the system spec, you know, how do I time a, a system? How do I use the session description protocol, which is that protocol that, James, we said we made those declarations. There's a protocol for that. Uh, then dash 20 is uncompressed active video. So not, not the ink piece, just, just the, the active raster. You packetize that, send it over IP. Dash 30, uncompressed PCM audio. And then dash 40 takes that that ANC space that, that we talked about, and that sends it as a separate stream. Completely independently routable, uh, very convenient, especially for things like live production. So how do we take what we just described, apply 2110 to this problem? Well, again, let's take the, the uh, case where, uh, you know, maybe I have a 25 gig port and I can just send, you know, one, one single stream of, of UHD, that's no, uh, no problem. But if I have two 10 gig ports, what do I do? Well, I can define in 2110 four uh, two SI flows, and, and we'll talk about this multi dash two SI in a second. And I can put two of them through one 10 gig port and the other another 10 gig port. But I need to be able to tell people that these are associated, right? So that the receiver can can build them back together. And we'll explain how we we do that. In a super motion case, it's it's kind of similar. Uh, let's say that, that we're, you know, we're in Europe, so it's 20 millisecond period. Every frame of a 6x camera would be 3.3 milliseconds, right? Divide by 6. So we can take each of those frames as a slice, and every sixth frame we put into a, basically, a, you know, a, a 1080i50 stream. And I can put three of those through one 10 gig port and three through another, right? So I can get them all over there. Again, I have to explain what that association with and announce that so a receiver can, can build them. Yeah, and that, again, for those of you not as familiar with super motion and high frame rate, because that's our daily world we live in, is the fact that these frames here, again, are a slice of time. That would have normally been a single frame of video if we were talking about live video here in this case, but in the super mo mode, you now have six times the information to possibly uh, right. move across that network. Exactly. So. You know, the, the issues though, as James explained with SDI, is, is we've got these SDI ports, there's nothing to tell you about the, the flows. I mean, you, you can label things, but in a truck environment, you know, you're changing things from show, show to show. All these cool features that you can automate, this, the same camera can do UHD or SD or super slow, and you can configure it with a button. Well, what about the wiring? That's all manual, yeah. right? And errors happen, so you can get mismatches all, all over the, the place. What we can do with IP is use this session description protocol, which is an IETF uh, standard, and, and describe each flow and that they are grouped together. And that's what we do. So starting, this is a session description protocol for a, a let's see, a 1080i uh, 50 flow. Yep. yep. So here's the frame rate. This is, this is actually part of every single flow in this area has an SDP file that describes what it is. So this is just the common, common language. Uh, and, and then there's IETF RFC 588, which decides a grouping mechanism, which allows you to take flows and say these are a group. And then there's a semantic that we will define, and, and we will uh, going to be registering this with IANA, which is the re agency that you register uh, various terms with for this. And you can say this A group phased, if you're doing uh, you know, super slow, or if you're doing dividing things into two SI streams, you do the multi two SI. So say what kind of group it is. And then this is an example with a um, uh, super slow. So I take the, the first frame, so I'm going to take frame one and then frame seven, which we're not picturing there. So every sixth frame in this case. And, and the first, uh, the first those, that group of frames is defined by this. So the, the first group's like this, and I don't think we have a slide for it, but then frame two would have another declaration like this. So you basically have six declarations like this with the numbers corresponding to which ones it is. And so each of them has an IP address. The receiver can receive those. It gets them to six separate streams, but it knows exactly how they're put together. 
Yeah, so literally in SDI, you never had this de declaration. You never knew what each of those phases were. They were simply six different sets of video on an SDI wire. You couldn't tell apart if you ever looked at them on a scope or anywhere. So now you're describing exactly what each one is and the relationship to each other. Yeah, and the cool thing about this as a, if, if you're uh, working with a truck company outside broadcast or something like that, you don't have to touch this. You're going to be able to plug the cables in, and it's just going to Work. connect and find. And at a higher level control system, say, I, I, you know, I want 6x and enable the camera, enable the server, and, and there you are. And just work. Yep. Um, so what are the key aspects of this? First of all, it's, it's a completely open standard. This is all standards based, which means I can, you know, for a nominal fee of like 150 bucks to load down a simply standard, something like that, I can see exactly how this works. Any vendor can build to it, right? Exactly. So if one vendor goes away, this still stands. Uh, it's very flexible and extensible. I don't care if it's 400 gig ports and you want to do, you know, 32K, you know, it, this, this will, will scale with that, so it's, it's future-proof in that sense. And because we're doing this, you, and it's computer to computer, you can em eliminate a whole bunch of errors and, 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 and troubleshooting problems. So when this started, uh, when James and I first did this stick, it, we, a year ago, I think. Year, a little, yeah, I think it was first time it was here, yep. right? At that point, uh, Ames had uh, come together and said, this was a gap in, in the standard. How are we going to do this? There's vendors with cameras and, and servers. How are we going to do this? And so we, we, we made a recommendation. We, we brought it to SIMPTI uh, at the end of last year. Uh, it's still in drafting, so it's not done. Mm -hmm. um, but it'll be a recommended practice. 2110 dash, probably 23 is, is the number. Don't hold us uh, to the that. The proposed number. And, and so, so as it works its way through, this also will be something that is open, clear, and is an engineering document within within uh, SIMPTI. So, this allows if if you're a vendor that has 10 gig switches, uh, our customer with 10 gig switches a day, that's going to work with this. You can take your super mode cameras and and configure them. You're going to use multiple ports, but you have the ports, so. That's good. Reconfigure without recabling. Time savings. Uh, being able to optimize the bandwidth. I, if I have, if you, you're going to have specialty cameras yep. in, in live sports. You don't want to buy all your ports to fit those cameras. That's, that's wasteful. So I, I, can, I can go more economical and, and still have an optimal configuration. Yep. Um, and I have a flexible IP network. All, all these things are, are, are great. And so you know, we just want to thank, this, this actually came, um, EBS and Grass Valley were very instrumental in, in, in proposing it, but there's a number of companies, uh, first within Ames, now within SIMPTI, the, the same drafting group that's, yep. that's built the standards, they're all contributing in, into this. So it's really been a, a team effort uh, that's kind of a microcosm of the collaboration that's, that's going on here that's moving our industry forward. So Yeah, I think it's a good foundation to remind the fact that we're taking open standards and we're identifying remaining use cases for the industry and we're basically coming up with not new standards for this but ways to implement this and solve problems for the real live production environment. Yeah. So with that, I think that's the end of our presentation and, and I don't know if Wes was going to manage any questions or if anyone out here has something to add to it. Yeah. So Clear as mud, or Wes is going to practice. Very clear. No, we, we we certainly enjoy that. So um, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, you know, I know this is a very complex subject. The most important thing to understand is that, you know, I think James said it very clearly at the beginning is that 2110 makes this easier. That's the whole point. This is this is a not a situation where we're going to put IP on there for the sake of IP. There's a real dynamic business benefit to this above and beyond all the other benefits of IP is that it makes, it really solves a problem. I think you can see the fact that all of us used to deal with SDI for many, many years and, and look at us. We've all lost our hair from uh, <laughs> working with SDI for so long. Yep, okay. So um, any questions from the audience? Okay, um, we're going to take a little uh, uh, five-minute break or so.